Good morning. Good morning. What a joy. How exciting. Come on. I feel like James Bond dashing in a car across to North. And I'm sure it's all going to be absolutely wonderful. Thank you again for the immense privilege uh, of being with you today. And thank you to the team for leading us so wonderfully in worship. Uh, it's always good to worship the Lord together and serve. And we're going to continue to worship Jesus together by thinking about some stuff in the Word of God. Uh, and I've got a, a really interesting <laughs> subject for you today. I want to talk today about being human, the call of the Creator. And the fact that actually God has something very powerful to say to every one of us about our humanness. We've been singing just as I was about to get up, I am a child of God. And we understand that because of something of the immense commitment of the Creator to become a Savior for every one of us. We are not only children of God simply uh, because of a decision we've made, but we are children of God because of decisions that he has made. And I, I want to read some stuff from the very beginning of the Bible. So if you've got a Bible with you, uh, either in like paper form like mine, or you've got maybe it on your phone or your tablet, why don't you turn to the very first page? It's Genesis chapter 1. And I want to read uh, just three short passages from what we sometimes refer to as the creation story. So Genesis, uh, the book of beginnings, begins with a story of creation, which runs from chapter 1 through to about the end of chapter 3. We're just going to sort of cherry pick some of the passages to help us dive straight in. So it's Genesis chapter 1. And I'm going to read, we'll jump, jump straight in, verse 26. So we're now in day six of creation. A lot has happened up to day six. And then in verse 26, it says this. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And then the story goes on a little bit. We have day seven in that beautiful rest account. So flick over to chapter two, and we're going to read from verse 18. Let me just read you one gorgeous reference of verse, uh, chapter two, verse seven. And then we'll jump to verse 18. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Then skip down to verse 18. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, or the man, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She is called woman, for she was taken out of the man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. And in one last little reading, chapter 3, verse 6, we'll pick it up from verse 6. When the woman saw the fruit, so she's been tempted now by the serpent with this incredible fruit at the center of the garden. And it says this, when the woman saw the fruit, that the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave it to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. 
But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I commanded you not to eat? And you can read the rest of the story for yourselves. Eugene Peterson uh, said these amazing words. He says, If we try to understand and form ourselves by ourselves, we leave out most of ourselves. He goes on to say this. He says, without this text, that's without the Bible, without this reference that we've just had together, he says, without this text firmly established as the authoritative center of our communal and personal lives, we will founder. If we, we will sink into a swamp of well-meaning but ineffectual men and women who are mired unmercifully in our needs and wants and feelings. When it comes to our humanness, the Bible has a lot to say in general. But when it comes to a real precise view of our humanness, the creation story, the Genesis story, has a huge amount to say to us. This first word book, literally it begins with the word beginnings. And we're introduced to these marvelous and magnificent ideas that God has presented to us. But I don't know about you, I've noticed in recent years, uh, in many Christian communities, there's been a nervousness generally about the Old Testament. And we're sort of backing away from some of the stuff in the Old Testament, which I think is a mistake, because if we read it properly, it is a lot to say to us. And remember, the Old Testament, as we call it, was the only Bible Jesus had. And he made sense of it. So I think we can make sense of it. But, but also, we're, we're not just backing away from the Old Testament. There's been a nervousness in recent years I've picked up that we're almost a bit squeamish about the creation story. Uh, and because of certain pressures around us, scientific and societal, we've sort of backed away from leaning hard into this amazing creation story. And I believe that that is a mistake. I think because of the pressures that we're now feeling from certain quarters, how society is changing, the view of our humanness is changing, the view of our sexuality and our gender even is changing as a result of that. Actually, it seems to me that the Genesis text has come back into vogue. And it's worthy of our consideration. And listen, <clears throat> however you read Genesis, the creation story, uh, the message of the creation story is the same, however you read it. So whether you're going to read it literally, literally six days, seven days to rest, the literalism of the text, which many Christians will hold to, but there will also be others who see it as a bit of an allegory, as a picture of something. However you read this text, ladies and gentlemen, it is the message that we cannot miss. And the rejection of a biblical narrative when it comes to our humanness, is a really dangerous idea. And when lots of people are talking about what it means to be human, we as followers of Jesus are, are asking the question, well, where do we get our narrative from? Who decides what human is? Who decides what the image of God looks like? Who decides who I am? And for a follower of Jesus, Generally speaking, it is the biblical narrative that creates this idea. I love what Joe Frost uh, and Peter Linus say in their book, Being Human. They say, writing your own script is a huge weight for any individual to bear. And that's happening in our world today. Humans are writing their own script on being humans. Now, you may think that's a cool idea. You may think that's okay. As a follower of Jesus, I'm always nervous when humans write the script because humans generally aren't great at writing their own script. That's why we need divine help. Uh, and actually, it's when in our arrogance we write our own script, we often then write things that, that may in the long term or in the short term even hurt our humanness. Actually, Genesis tells us, and creation story in particular tells us, you don't need to write your own script. A script has been written for you. And if you will have the courage to lean into the messages of the script, it might have something to say, not only to me as a follower of Jesus, but it might even help me to interpret some of the conversation about humanness in the world in which I am 
living. Does that make sense? And we're introduced to this amazing story. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. God uh, is introduced to us as this creator God. In the beginning, a perfect seven-word Hebrew statement. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But then we're told in verse 2, the material he's working with. It says this in verse 2. Now, the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the whole surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, or as a member of our small group once said, hoovering over the waters, which is a cool idea. I like the idea of the Holy Spirit hoovering. I do. Uh, that's, a, that's an image that we want to capture right there. Now, when we look at the creation story, here's the idea. This God, whoever he is, this Elohim God, this creator God, takes material that is without form, without substance, and without purpose, and by the end of the week of creation, he has given it shape, he has given it substance, and he has given it purpose. He takes something that is formless and empty and dark and chaotic, and by the end of that week, we have something absolutely gloriously amazing. And the peak of that order, the creative climax of that amazing creation process of taking shapelessness and giving it shape, of taking emptiness and giving it substance, and of taking chaos and giving it order. The creational peak are the humans. The humans that God makes are the, the finest act of creating things in this beautiful creation week. And in fact, God says this. He says, let us make humankind in our image and in our likeness. And as we approach the end of day six, God makes these incredible humans. But so what? So what? Does that mean anything to us in the 21st century in terms of what God made or who God made or how God made them? Does this ancient text, thousands of years old, could it possibly have something to say to us in our sophisticated, dynamic, individually rampant uh, 21st century world? Now, I believe it does. But of course, you have, you've paid your money. You have to take your choice on that. If you believe that the Genesis account is a script written for us, worthy of our consideration, then what we're about to learn together has really powerful meaning for the 21st century. If you don't believe it's relevant, then everything I'm about to say, you can just put in the bin. Because ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, if we're going to define our own humanness, then if we do it on our own, we're going to come up with something less than God originally designed. If we're prepared to see God's design of humanness, then we have the potential of coming up with something truly amazing that is worth contending for, and it's worth leaning into, and it is worth celebrating, even in the confusion and the many voices of our 21st century world. Does that make sense? So I'm committed to the Genesis account. I'm committed to the creation account. I believe there are ideas here that are worthy of our consideration and that will empower us to move forward. And I'm going, to la I'm, I'm going to try and give you four big ideas that I, I would encourage you to think about and mull over and, and hunt down in your own study and processes. As you're thinking about the conversations that are going on in your world, as you're thinking about who's getting to speak about humanness into your world, into your family, into your community, maybe allowing God's voice to speak into our humanness will help us. And there are four ways in which God speaks. Here's the first way. I'll, I'll call it this, intimacy. We see, first of all, the intimacy of God in this amazing story. Look at what it says in verse 26. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image. Now, if, you, if we had read the whole of Genesis 1 together, you would have heard a beautiful little pattern because you would have heard up to this point God saying, let, 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 let. This is the first time we hear, let us. So when you have a pattern in the Bible, and Genesis, the creation story, is full of patterns. When you get a repeat pattern, and then the pattern breaks, you should pay attention. So for example, in Genesis 1, you get, it was good, 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 it was very good. Oh, at that point, we should go, why is it very good? Yeah. 
And then later on when he says it's not good, we should go, why is it not good? Everything's been good, this is very good, that's not good. It's written in a way to draw your attention to the big ideas at the heart of the text. So in Genesis chapter 1, we're getting this sort of let language, and then we hear this let us. And that should cause us to pause and ask the question, who is the let us and what are they doing? And I want to show you something really powerful. In Genesis chapter 1, we have six references to let. So it says something like, let there be light. Okay? And you get those references, verses 6, verse 9, verse 11, verse 14, verse 20, verse 24. Okay, so they're all there. Every time God says a let, it's to make a thing. And everything he makes is good. All right? That's the pattern. So every time you see a let, God makes a thing. And when he looks at that thing, he says, it's good. Okay? Yeah. Then we come to let us. This unusual change. And what do we notice? When God says, let us, he doesn't make a thing. He makes people. He makes not a something. He makes a someone. And when he looks at that someone or those two people, male and female, made in his image, he doesn't say it's good. He says it's very good. And one way of interpreting that is it's his very best. So we get this beautiful idea of something that has changed in the way the creator is making the humans. Up to this point, he's simply like, let, 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 and that's good. But now there's a let us involved, and it's to do with people, and God declares it to be very good. And then we move into chapter 2, and this is where chapter 2 helps the end of chapter 1. Sometimes people look at chapter 2, and they think it's two creation stories, because you've got like God making the humans at the end of chapter 1, and then you've got this story about God forming the man out of the dust and building the woman out of a rib. What's going on there? Now, it's not two creation stories, in my opinion. It's the super zoom into this moment of creation with the humans. It's like we are zooming in. And two things happen in chapter 2 which are really powerful. Number one, God's name becomes more intimate. So in chapter 1, verses 1 to chapter 2, verse 4, Elohim, creator God, is mentioned 34 times in 34 verses. He's the dominant idea. When we move into chapter 2, the Elohim, the God, becomes Lord God. He becomes slightly more intimate in his language. And in fact, he remains Lord God in chapter 2 and chapter 3. And then he becomes Lord, the covenant name of, of God, in chapter 4. There's a progression towards intimacy. That's the first thing we notice if we're reading it really carefully. The second thing is the way he makes the humans. And the way he makes the humans is totally intimate. Look at this. It says, then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now, if you work literally with me, work literally, this, this mist has come up from the ground, it's wet the dust, and it's turned the dust into sort of clay. Now, if you work with me literally, you get the image of this God who's been speaking, speaking, speaking these awesome words in chapter 1. What's he doing in chapter 2? He's literally getting down into the clay and scooping the clay up with his fingers, and he's molding a man, a human, into this form that if me and you went back in a time machine, that would be a human. We, we would recognize that human. And it's like a child playing on the beach building a sandcastle. God is literally forming the human out of the dust, out of the clay with his fingers. He's gone from speaking this, these awesome words. Now it's very intimate. He's using his fingers. And then when he brings the man to life, it's even more intimate. He breathes up the man's nose. And the man becomes a living being. Now, work literally with me. If God's going to breathe up your nose, he's got to get really close to your face. And if the man opens his eyes, the first thing he sees is the face of God. It's a deliberate picture. It's a picture of 
creational intimacy. And it doesn't stop there. God then can't find a partner for this man, so he puts the man to sleep. He takes something out of the side of the man. We like the idea of the rib. He, pick, he picks it out, and he literally, the Hebrew says, literally builds a woman. Come on. Thank God. He built a woman out of the rib. That's the literal translation. And he builds her. And again, the idea of building, he's taking the rib out of the man with his hands, and now he's constructing. He's building this woman. The woman hasn't just been abracadabra The woman has been framed and shaped and built with the fingers of God. Just as the man is scooped up out of the dust, just, just as the man was lovingly uh, sculptured by the fingers of God, so is the woman in this context. And what's the point? The point is this. God's wanting to give us a message. The intimacy with which he makes the humans means automatically we are different. We're different from the animals. We're different from fish. We're different from birds. We're different. We're different. We're different. We're different. We're different. But in what way are we different? Actually, we're better. God says the humans are very good, not just good. And, and in what way are we better? We are like him. So you get the intimacy idea. Humans are made by the fingers of God, and humans are given life by the breath of God. That's really important for us. We, as a Judeo-Christian worldview, believe that humanity's origin came from God himself. Now, however you believe that, however you understand that, that is a crucial idea. Because if we really believe that, then it means humanity can never fully be complete without returning to the God who scooped him out of the mud and built her out of him. Are you with me? Okay, that's the first idea. Second idea, image. Look at this. Let us make humankind in our image and in our likeness. So our English Bibles are working really hard there to show us that in the Hebrew, there's a lovely little difference going on. And in fact, it sounds like the same idea is being repeated. Image and likeness. That's just saying the same thing twice. Well, yes and no. In the Hebrew text, the word image, tselem, is a masculine noun. In Hebrew, the, the word likeness, demut, is a feminine noun. So you've got this idea nuanced in the text that God is making humans and he is suggesting that the humans will reflect his image, but even in the context of image, there's a maleness to the image and there's a femaleness to the image. It's already there. It's already implied. Now, if that idea is implied, when we get to chapter 2, to that zoom in bit, this really goes platinum. And God says these words. It is not good for the man to be alone, incomplete. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, there's been a lot of debate around that phrase, suitable helper, but it's an amazing idea. It doesn't, it doesn't just mean uh, the idea of just somebody serving. It means the idea of somebody coming alongside to complete. And in fact, the fact that God makes the woman out of the side of the man ha ha is at a meaning level absolutely amazing. He doesn't build her out of his feet. He doesn't build her out of his head. He doesn't build her out of his back. He builds her out of his side. If you miss that message, you've missed a colossal idea. That's right there in the creation story. Male and female were meant to operate in absolute partnership in the creative order. Under the headship of God and working as partners together. But I, I want you to see this, making a helper suitable for him. The word suitable there in English it doesn't really convey the dynamic paradox of the Hebrew word. The word in Hebrew is konegdo, and it's a sort of a contradictory idea. It's a compound word, and it's the idea of being um, like, but also being different. It's the idea that something is like, but it's also opposite. It's different. So when God makes a helper suitable for the man, here's what he's trying to do. Here's his thought process. He's trying to make something that's like the man, but has to be different from the man in order to complete the man. It cannot be another man. 
It cannot be another like the one he's made. If he's going to complete the man, he needs something that's sort of human, but something that's different from the male human. That's the idea in the word. It's right there. It's so powerful. Our English translation loses it in, in, in a dramatic way. But the Hebrew is absolutely strong on this idea. Like me, but opposite to me. Wow, what an idea. Now, what's the point? How do we conclude here? Well, we conclude this. When we think about the woman being made for the man, we conclude this. That number one, she was human. She was the same. So the same bit is human. God couldn't find a partner for the man among the animals. Why? Because the animals are not human. Only the human is made in the image of God. Therefore, you cannot find a compatible with a lesser image. So God has to make something human. So he makes this person human, but then he makes her female different. So now we've got the introduction of a human person built out of the man, but she's different from the man. She is female. The, 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 the prime minister of New Zealand, when he took the job recently, this went viral on, on social media. He was asked the question, what is a woman? Define a woman. And he couldn't do it. He struggled to define a woman. The Genesis account really helps us. A woman is human, adult, female. That's a good starting point. Are you with me? Human, adult, female. I watched a creation program yesterday or a program about the origin of the universe, uh, and they were talking about the development of a chimpanzee in its, in its mother's womb. And it was amazing to me, all the language being used of the chimpanzee was human. They humanize the chimpanzee. And I thought for a moment, do you know what I'm seeing? I'm seeing a humanization of the animal world and a dehumanization of the human world. <laughs> if we had been looking at a program with humans, we would have called the baby a fetus. We would have called the baby an embryo. He was calling a baby chimpanzee a baby. He was referring to the baby as she, even giving the baby a name. And I thought, that's amazing. We've humanized the animals, and we're dehumanizing the humans. There's something going on there. And I think creation has something to say to us. What do we learn about this pattern? We learn that the humans are equal, yet different, both in God's image, but both different. And we learn that they are the same, yet different. They are human, yet different. So male and female, made in the image of God, yet a different representation of that image. Male and female, made different, yet both made equal in the sight of God. Amen? That's a great idea. That's, that's a big idea worthy of your consideration. And the fact that they were made intimately and with individuality is both highlighted and celebrated. Now, this builds us to the big moment of the creation story. And this is, the big, this is the big turning point of the story. But what most Christians do is we jump into the terrible, catastrophic events of Genesis chapter 3, when the humans sin, and what happens there, without understanding the intimacy and image conversation that has gone before. When we understand the intimacy of God and the image of God in the humans in chapters 1 and 2, then chapter 3 becomes even more profound in its message to us. And let me show you this. And I want to show you this through the idea of idolatry. So we've had intimacy, image, now idolatry. Now look at this, verse, uh, verse 6 of chapter 3. It says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye. Now, I, I don't know about you, when I read the Genesis story, I'm asking, what did she see? And what did she see that day that she hadn't seen before? This woman had seen this tree every day. She lived in this garden. She knew about this tree. She was told not to eat this tree. So it's not like it's a sudden surprise. Oh, wow, tree, garden, that's amazing. No, no, she had seen this every single day. So what is she seeing she hasn't seen before? Here's my suggestion to you. She's seeing the tree for herself. So look at the language. Look at what it says. She saw that the tree was good for food. Well, they've got loads of food in the garden. Pleasing to the eye and desirable for gaining 
wisdom. At the heart of this idea, something has awakened in her for her. Are you with me? She's now seeing something different. This tree still looks the same, but she's seeing it now as a benefit to her. And of course, we know what happens. The man and the woman both eat. And then a number of things happen. First of all, it says this. They, they realized they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together to make coverings for themselves. Now, really interesting, there's a big play on the word coming up here, so I want to really give you this. When they make the coverings, the word for covering is the idea of loincloth. So what they're covering up is not their whole body. What they're covering up is their genitalia. In other words, what they're covering up are the distinctive markers of their difference and the distinctive markers of the God image within them. A man and a woman from the waist up sort of roughly look the same. I know the proportions can be different. I get all of that. But, but, but roughly we look the same. We've got the same sort, of, same sort of idea at the top. But a man and a woman from the waist down look completely different. And it's the waist down at a physical level that shows the dynamic difference between male and female. And isn't it interesting that that's the bit they cover up. They cover it with fig leaves. They grab these, these leaves off the tree and patch it together in some sort of terrible construction, and they end up with this appalling uh, sort of loincloth gathered around their waist. Now, what's going on here? Well, it's just a covering, right? Well, maybe or maybe not. Here's my suggestion to you. They covered their nakedness because they were covering how they were made. And they covered their difference in that they covered who they were made. Are you with me? They've covered how they've been made, how he made them. He made them male and female. And then look, they cover their difference. He's covered, they've covered up who he made. So when the humans are covering up, they are literally opposing God's image definition of them. They're saying the way God made us needs to be covered. Now, when you step away from God, when you step away from His image, when you step away from His ideas, then actually we're down to defining ourselves. And we're down to actually working out, right, what, who am I and what do I look like? And here's the humans. And there's a big play on the word naked in the creation story. And naked isn't just about not having clothes on. The naked idea as a picture is this idea of celebrating the image of God, celebrating the way God made them. Now, when they sin, the first thing they do is challenge the image of God. This, ladies and gentlemen, now please don't be offended. This is an act of idolatry. This is not about gender at this stage. This is not about your sexuality at this stage. This is not about preference at this stage. This is about saying, God made me naked. I don't want to be naked. I'm going to cover up. I'm going to dress this body the way I want to dress it, irrespective of how God feels about that. And that's why God says to them, who told you you were naked? Where did that come from? Have you eaten of the tree that I told you not to eat? So they cover up how they were made, and they cover up who he made them. But look at the second thing that they do. They hide. It says that they hid from the Lord God. They literally run and hide behind the bushes, one of the most futile acts in the creation story, trying to hide from the God who sees everything, the God who knows everything, the God who already knows what's happened. And God begins to ask a series of questions. In fact, he has to ask the man three questions before he gets an answer, a proper answer. And he asks a series of questions. Why? Because he wants to draw the humans away from the bushes, and he wants to draw them into the light of his presence, and he wants to get to a stage where he can take this covering off so that he can deal with them properly. You see, that hiding and that covering is the exact opposite to the way God created them. 
He created them to be face to face with him, and he created them to live in absolute freedom and transparency in their own God-shaped identity before him. That's why the text can say they were naked and they felt no shame. And here's what I've discovered. Our brokenness will always lead us away from God's pattern and God's presence. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me carefully. A lot of the conversation on humanness is the conversation of brokenness. And you never build something healthy from brokenness. If your view is coming from a place of brokenness, it's never going to end up in the right place of healthiness. If we want to restore brokenness, we've got to go back to the original ideas the original design. And brokenness, human brokenness, will always do two things. It will lead us away, number one, from the presence of God, because we've got to get as far away from the God who made us as possible, because the closer we get to him, the more it reminds us of his image in us, and the more it reminds us that my image is not the image he wants. But the further we get away from him, it allows me to become the captain of my own soul. Now, Romans chapter 1 has become a big debating chapter in modern times. Big argument around Romans chapter 1 because there's a section of the Christian community wants to use Romans chapter 1 as the opportunity to bash uh, homosexuality, uh, LGBT community, etc., etc. Now, let me say, read Romans chapter 1 really carefully from Paul. Paul's not going after LGBTQ. Paul is not anti-homosexual in chapter 1 of Romans. Good, I got your attention. Some of you just woke up, so that's great. Thank you. God is, uh, Paul is not anti-LGBTQ in Romans chapter 1. That's a wrong reading. It's a terrible reading. Here's what Paul is anti. Idolatry. The issue of Romans chapter 1 is not sexuality, ladies and gentlemen. The issue is idolatry. Look at what Paul says. Paul says three times, and when you read Romans chapter 1 and go back to the creation story, you can't miss the link. Paul says three times that they have exchanged the glory of the immortal God. He goes on to say this. They have exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And then he goes on to say, even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural in the same way men also abandoned natural relations with, for sh with women for shameful acts. So, so what we focus in on is that, that gay bit of that. That's not what Paul is talking about. Paul is talking about the exchange. What's the exchange? Here's the exchange. It's where I decide who I am, not God. That's the exchange. Now, once that happens, everything's up for grabs. Your sexuality, your gender, anything you want is now up for grabs. Why? Because we've exchanged his glory for our desire. Once I take away from God the right of God to define who I am, then I get to define who I am. When I define who I am, that is the ultimate act of being God in my own life. Are you with me? Are you sure? And look what Paul says very powerfully. He says, because of this three times, God gave them over to their sinful desires. God gave them over to shameful lusts. God gave them over to a depraved mind. Now, we interpret that as God giving people over to their sexuality. No, no. What God's done is he's saying, if you want to be the boss, be the boss. But then you're going to have to, like, live with that. It's going to be a whole bunch of stuff you're going to have to contend with. That's exactly what happens in the Genesis account. In the creation account, the man and the woman reach out for something they don't need to become someone they already are. They grab the fruit they eat. The minute they do that, they now have autonomy in their own lives. They now are the captains of their own destiny, and they stand there. Ladies and gentlemen, the greatest act of idolatry is placing my I am above the I am. And listen, there's a big debate going out there, and you've got, to, you've got to hear that. Humans want to take the place that only God can sit in. 
It's God who defines who we are. It's God who defines our image. And when humans reject God, then we get to write our own script. And once we start writing our own script, we become literally living examples of idolatry. And God is desperately trying to save us from that idea. My time has gone, but let me finish with this last idea. And then we are literally in the car and we are going. Look at this, intervention. Do want to leave it there? Because I want to leave it on a positive note as we go to worship. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Now look at this. It's a beautiful play on the word. The humans made coverings. God made clothes. In fact, the word means a garment from neck to foot for both male and female. Where they were covered by these terrible, terrible coverings, God now makes clothes. But what does he make the clothes out of? Skins of the animal. Listen to me carefully, ladies and gentlemen. For the image of God to be redeemed, something had to die. Something had to die. Here's what the Bible says. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The Son of God took on fully sexed male human form. He wasn't a plastic human, he was a real human. A real human man, a fully sexed human man. But here's what he did. He surrendered his humanness. He surrendered his sexuality. He surrendered his gender. He surrendered all that he was as a human for the glory and will of God. He redeemed humans from the act of idolatry of being their own God by surrendering his right by surrendering himself and by dying on the cross. John says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And ladies and gentlemen, ultimately, the message of the scriptures is the call of the creator. There is a creator God who has made humans intimately. He's made humans in his image. He's made humans lovingly. And humans decided, no, no, we want to be captains of our own destiny. We want to make our own image. And in the ultimate act of idolatry, they said, we want our I am to trump his I am. So what does God do? He sends his son in the human form that he made in the garden of Eden. That son surrenders his I amness to the great I am of the father, dies on the cross so that you and I can be clothed in righteousness, the righteousness of Christ, so that we can discover truly that we are children of God, so that we can understand our humanness, not as it's being defined by people writing their own script, but as is defined by the Creator Himself. It's not just the call of the Creator, it's the call of the Savior. And the Savior is saying to me and you, will you surrender your I am to thee I am. Will you allow what God says about you to trump what even you say about you? Will you allow the message of truth to override even the desire for preference? Will you allow the call of the Creator and the Savior to speak to the confusion of our human world and say, There is an image. There is a God. There is a hope. There is a truth. And if we will lean into His glory, I believe not only can we recapture that image, but we can shine as lights in the darkness as we hold forth the word of truth. May God bless you. May God help you. And may we all live as humans onto Him and for His glory. Amen.